gluing or pinning, what's best for flexible track? Let's have a look. So welcome back to Chadwick Model Railway. Um, I do apologise for not making many videos in the last month, but working as a photographer July is a very, very busy month for me. The last few videos I've done have actually been how-tos. I think I did one on airbrushes, another on airbrushing tankers, and the last one I did was on landscaping. I made a, um, a, hill, set, a hill set from polystyrene, and the links um, to that should be above. But this video, what I'm going to do now is I need, this board has been in for quite some time, so what I need to do now is level the next board um, to make sure that they mate perfectly. This board is 36 inches above the ground and the reason I went for 36 inches is that I can easily reach across the board to maintain it and to keep the track clean, that kind of thing, and also build it. But also, when you're sitting down, it's an ideal height just to watch your trains go by. So, how do I make the legs right for the next board so they mate with this? Well, to manufacture them to the, exactly the right uh, dimension is actually quite difficult. You think if the boards are level then you just cut them all the same height. Well, that's not quite true because the floor of this room does kind of move away and it undulates a little bit. So, what I did buy from Squires um, at a model railway show were these adjustable brackets. And as you can see, once this bracket is screwed into place, you can simply adjust the foot up and down to give you the right lift and the right length on the leg. Seems quite straightforward. All I have to do now is to make three of them. So the legs are on and the board's secure to the wall. And the good thing is it's level. And as we run down to the other end of the, the layout, where the board which goes into the curve is, and you can see now how much um, that one's dropped. So obviously when I move on to that board, that one there will clearly have to be jacked up. And then if we look down the leg here, there's one of those brackets that I bought from Squires to make sure the boards stay level. So it, it seems a good idea. So that's both boards level and secure and bolted to the wall. But before I can lay any track, I think what I really need to do is bolt the, these boards together. And to that end, what I've bought is some zinc plated roofing bolts size M60 and they're 50 millimeters long and they come with washers and nuts. So all I'm gonna do is use two bolts, bolt these two together and the same on the other end once when I get down to that end, once I've laid this track, because what I'm going to do now is lay the track into this station area and then when I'm almost up to the other board, I'll then get that board all level, fit the points and then bring the two tracks together and hopefully we should be good to go. Okay, so that's the boards uh, now bolted together and they're as firm as they're ever going to be. Um, and for this, this may be a major mistake, but I'm going to reuse some older um, Pico Code 100 uh, 00 track. Um, I've got tons of this stuff and I really can't afford to just throw it away and go and buy perhaps Code 75 or even Bullhead. Um, I've got, just got so much of this it would be financially irresponsible really for me to just to, to chuck it. Um, if you're going to reuse track, track, one thing perhaps you want to think about is to make sure you're not using a piece such as this which is actually steel and if you pop a magnet onto it, it will clearly stick. So it's always sensible just to run a magnet over any track that you wish to reuse because the last thing you want to do is find yourself an old steel piece of track that will do nothing but rust. When you cut track, I either tend to use these professional track cutters, but if you use these please, please don't use them vertically because what you'll do is you'll crush the profile of the track and it's a so-and-so to try to get a needle file in there to re, to re um, profile it. So always cut it horizontally and you don't crush the, uh, the base rail. But I must confess, I always tend to go for a disc cutter um, and um, you, you get a much more consistent result. But that's the a personal preference thing. So... Where do we go from here? Well, um, in true Blue Peter style, as I did previously, this is my platform and it's made by Pico. Um, and um, that's exactly how I want it to be. It's a, it's, it's a, the right length for a loco and six mark three coaches. So it's a fair old length. I can't really have it any, any longer because obviously you're into the, 
into the curve there at the other end. Um, and if you're using Pico platform, uh, then you need to know that obviously your track will sit on foam or whatever, but your platform needs to sit on it as well to give you the correct height for your coaches. So yes, the platform sits on the same substance on which your track sits, and then it gives you the right height um, for your coaches on the side of the platform, if that all makes sense. I've mentioned in the past that what I'm going to do is I have, um, if you like, a line that goes down the back of that platform. I have the platform line itself. I have a fast up and a fast down line. And then I also have a line um, that then comes along the platform on the other side. So hopefully you can see that I have four tracks in the centre and one over the side. There will also be one more track that comes around into a bay platform, which should be the parcels line. Talking about track distances, Pico do make a clever little device known as a Pico six-way gauge. It's a piece of plastic and it is as cheap as chips. There are two lugs on each side. The top two are for the kind of kiddie set track um, uh, distances between the tracks and the bottom two lugs are to give you a prototypical spacing in double in double o, uh, sorry in street with streamlined track so what i'll use this for as i lay this track is to make sure i've got the right spacing um, on these lines but i actually want the two the main up and the main down to be further apart because i'm going to have a footbridge going across and i'd like a center pillar to, to support the footbridge so what I'll actually use, I will use the set track gauge to kind of give me that extra uh, distance, but it will be a consistent distance then right through the station. And then on the other side here, I'll bring that one in and that will kind of be the look of it. And if I can get that right to give you the right impression, so that'll be about right. That's the set track. There's back to the and then bring that track in there, uh, plug them in there, oops. And that's the way, hopefully, it will look right through. Obviously, these tracks have got to be kind of um, bent into position and uh, to make sure they, they take through the curve and then go straight through the station. So that's my kind of uh, objective. Um, I don't normally pin track. I normally glue the stuff down. But if you do pin it, what I suggest you do is you pin um, the sleepers to the board and not not to drill a hole through the center if you drill a hole through the center and then tack it you can end up with this sleeper kind of bending down um, whereas if you pin it on the outside with a little pin vise and then use the pico pins and tap them in then you'll get a much more sort of prototypical finish so um, i'll start with this and i'll let you know how i'm getting on what i have done before i started was on this board here, I fitted fish plates to uh, the end of the rails to give me a head start um, and then go downboard from there. So here's a better view of those four tracks um, and that's where the platform will kind of finish. Um, and as you can see, I've already fish plated these and I'll bring the tracks across like so. And then this one here is actually code 100 running into a code 75. Uh, insule frog double, sorry, electro frog double slip. Um, the reason I've got a code 75 is I, I always fit electro frog rather than insule frog. I just find them to be um, just a little bit more reliable and of course they look a little bit more uh, prototypical because there's less plastic on view. So what I shall do now next is, um, is I'll start to uh, lay this track and we'll see how we get on.
Now during that previous time lapse sequence, you probably see me holding this uh, little mirror. Clearly I've been up into my wife's things and I borrowed her little vanity mirror. Um, and the reason I use this is you can then look along the track to see if it's actually straight. And then hopefully you can see back up to that line to make sure the track is straight. Invariably you won't be able to see this as your, as your trains go running around, but if you use a, um, one of these track cameras, which I do, um, invariably it will show every sort of kink uh, in the track. So it's always worth getting a mirror, looking along the track to see how it's kind of shaping up. Now here on the track that I've yet to lay, you can see how wonky it is. So you can see the advantage of using this mirror to look along the track. I mentioned earlier that I normally uh, glue my track down with something like Evo Stick Time Bomb, but you can of course pin them and this is the way that I would recommend pinning it down. A few tools you'll need, you'll need a small pin vise and drill. I use Pico's SL14 track pins, um, some kind of a drift, I just use this old valve from an old motorbike of mine and a smallish hammer. So how do I do it? Well, if we zoom in here, you can. this is the old track and this is the new piece coming through the platform. And as you can see, it isn't pinned down. So if I zoom right in, and then with this uh, pin vise drill, what I tend to do is, hopefully not getting in the way of the camera, is I then drill two holes in the sleepers. If I do the back one first, I know you can't really see this. So I drill through the sleeper, through the cork and then I'm going into now the plywood and then come back out of there and on the other side I do exactly the same. So onto the sleeper, drill through the sleeper, into the cork and then into the board itself and then bring that back out. Then, with these SL14 track pins, now they are fiddly, but then they are discreet. So if I pop one of those into that hole I drilled, and it goes down a fair way, and then with my trusty hammer and drift, I tap it in and then one on the other side. And I would normally tap these in about every six inches or so because at the end of the day the track will be held down by the ballast. So these are only a temporary measure. On a curve you might find you're going to do it every two inches or so. Now if I give it a wiggle you can see it's pretty rock, rock solid and that's where the pin is and if I can zoom in even tighter and I don't know if you can see there is where the pin is and I think it's pretty discreet. Um, normally you won't see this and um, obviously weathered in you're never ever going to see this pin whatsoever so it's a pretty good way of doing it. So time's now moved on a little and the passing loop line um, is in and glued and I checked with the platform clearances um, with a Mark III coach and also the station line and the fast uh, track up is, is in and uh, secure. Um, what I actually did was I pinned one of these instead of gluing it just to see how that would go and it was and it was the, plat the platform line. I pinned it rather than glued it and it's absolutely fine. Yeah, so, you know, it really is an alternative if you want to pin it or glue it. Both have their advantages and disadvantages. I just prefer to glue it. And if you make a mistake with the glue, and let's say you've got a bit of a dog leg, then, you know, at a, at a rail join, then you can just simply slide under um, a wallpaper uh, stripper. It just, you know, bites through and clears, uh, and clears the glue. And then you can just push the join to take away the dog leg and then just repin it with a... Uh, a pin vise so you kind of use both tools really but uh, there we are so I'm just going to glue this one down now and I'll take you through how I do that the glue is that uh, time bomb I also use the track setter um, template kind of gauge 
and this is the straight, uh, obviously a straight one because I'm running through the straights. Um, and it's crucial really if you're uh, reusing track. And then when I finally glue it and put it into place, I put the track setter across the rail join to make sure that join stra stays straight. Um, I mentioned before about um, the Pico six foot weigh gauge, which I'll use again. I use a needle file just to reprofile the, the join so that the, um, the PL12, I can't see without my glasses on, the PL14 um, rail joiners, make sure they fit on nice and snug, and the mirror to make sure the track's straight. So that's what are the kind of bits I use. So I'll just run through this um, and then I'll show you exactly how I, how I do it. So here's the, uh, the fresh piece of track and I just make sure that these fish plates uh, fit okay onto the existing track and they slide in quite snugly. As you can see, uh, this is a, I'm reusing a piece of track here, you can see where it's been pinned in the centre previously and I thought I'll mask those holes when the whole job's finished. I can see the fill them before I um, weather it or of course I can just put a piece of railway line and lie it through the centre of the tracks as you would normally find um, you know dotted around uh, the, the permanent way today. So the next thing to use is this six foot weigh gauge and if you recall I'm going to use the set track measurement um, to, uh, to give me a, a larger distance in the centre as, the, as we run down the lines. Looking down where this track uh, then joins the next piece, I'm using insulated rail joiners. Um, and those are only necessary really with computer control. I just need to cut this into districts so that the computer that controls my locos will actually know um, which pieces of track are occupied. Um, and if you're not into computer control, then you would just use the standard um, metal sleepers um, to secure one track to the other. Of course, the other thing we need is power to these lines and invariably um, I need to solder on droppers um, both to this track and of course the following one because of the insulated rail joiners. Um, so that's my, my next task. So we'll get out the soldering iron and do those parts next and I just need to mark on the top of the rails whereabouts I'm going to um, do my droppers. Now hopefully you've seen um, my previous videos on soldering um, and uh, if I run through this a bit too fast then hopefully you can check a look at, take a look at those and figure it out. Right, so I've cut the webbing, all I want to do next is to use a little bit of uh, emery cloth and all I do is take off the kind of shine on the bottom of the rails and the idea is to solder your cables onto the bottom of the rails so they, complete, they always remain completely invisible. So. I drop it into a tiny little bit of flux, get my old trusty soldering iron, put a drop of solder on there and I tin both the black and the red cables. Couldn't really be any simpler. And then with a uh, a kind of screwdriver or whatever, yep there's one, I get a drop of this flux and I pop it on that rail join there, uh, the, uh, where I cut, on the rail where I've cut it away from the webbing, put some flux on there, then a lot more, drop more flux on the cable ends themselves because I find that soldering to the nickel silver um, rail is one of the kind of more difficult jobs and then I solder with the, the cables running inwards rather than outwards so they're easier to, uh, easier to disguise. Now I know that my top rails, my outside rails are black so therefore this one needs to be the black one. Hopefully you can see, yes you can. And then pop a dollop of solder on there. Hold it still for a few seconds. And then the red is exactly the same. Let me see if I can do it the wrong way around so you can see better. Not very really doing left handed. If I drop more on there.
and hopefully on live TV you give them a tug and they stay on and then simply repeat for the next track. Obviously get them the right way around because I know my inside tracks are always um, positive they're, so they're fed by the red cable. Um, so that was that. So I'll repeat for those, close up the webs again and then we'll crack on. So there's these two tracks roughly back in position and here are their droppers. Obviously we need a hole um, to show uh, to get rid of the droppers back under the uh, underside of the board. So we mark out those. Quick whiz with a drill. Please check underneath to make sure there's nothing in the way before you uh, before you do that. And then it's just a case of simply threading those cables underneath. And now with the cables threaded through their holes, you can see they are quite discreet. And then once that's ballasted and weathered in, there's no way in the world you'll be able to spot those, uh, those solder joins because they're on the bottom of the rail rather than on the side. So now we're moving on to the gluing stage. But before we do that, we must be 100% happy that the profile through this join is exactly as we want it. Um, and as it happens, it wasn't. And if, you, if I zoom in here, you can see that I've actually moved this track here um, a few millimetres uh, closer to the wall. And you can see where I'd weathered it previously. So I've actually moved it back and then repinned it. You can see there's a slight bit of movement there and repinned it. It was glued before. All I did was use the wall, uh, wallpaper uh, scraper underneath, lifted it, moved it across and then pinned it using those SL14 track pins, which worked out perfectly. So we know that that joins good to go. We're happy with the profile. Um, so now it's time to run the um, transetter template through the tracks. So that clips in and then all you simply do is run it up and down the track. And that should take out any small kinks that exist. And remembering this is one of my, this is my fast down line so I really don't want any derailments on this uh, on this piece <coughs> excuse me so that's good to go next thing to do is using the six foot weigh gauge make sure it's in the right place and you remember I'm using the uh, the set track distance that's kind of in the right place there I might have to pull against the cables where they went through um, for the droppers yep pretty good next is the mirror to look down the track uh, it seems pretty square and after that then now it's time for the time bond so I just disconnect one end tip it back towards me and then run the time bond right along the whole of the track when it's on I'll then wait a few minutes before I tip it over with this stuff you you're supposed to make it let it go tacky before you actually put the surfaces together. And the beauty of this is that if you do make a mistake, it's quite simple with that um, wallpaper trowel to so just to lift a small section um, or indeed the whole of the track. Just whip up this bit. And now just wait a few minutes for that to go tacky and then I'll turn it over. So a few minutes have elapsed and now it's a case of gently turning it over and the first thing to do is to feed in those fish plates into the existing track work. And that's those and that's those gone in. So gently press the rest of it down and then with the six foot weigh gauge, make sure it's in the right place. And as I work my way down the track, I'm obviously pushing it uh, 
against the against the cork and that all seems fine <clears throat> next thing is the track setter and I'll pop that into place that will push in and then forcibly run this through the track and then finally I've used a piece of timber now just to make sure it does bear right up against this timber all the way through and this could be the advantage of using track pins sometimes is you could simply if it does tend to bulge a little bit then you could always use the track pin just to pull it in so check that gauge again And then finally a quick look down with the mirror. And it's looking good. And when you're absolutely convinced that it's in the perfect place, of course the last thing to do is to weight it down whilst it dries. I knew there's a good reason for buying all these railway books. So what started out as more of a catch-up video than anything else actually turned out to be a how-to video in the end. And that's most of this board done now. The parcel line's complete and all I have to do in slow time, once the other board is complete as we run down the other end, is obviously take those last lines across onto the other board. So hopefully you could see that both pinning and gluing track um, are two useful tools. Um, what you find best for you um, is really down to your own layout, but there's a place for both methods uh, in my book. Running um, a camera through the tracks, hopefully you can see that those lines are pretty straight and there are no dog legs uh, on the curves or through the points. Well hopefully you've enjoyed the video, please leave a comment uh, in the comment section and perhaps even give us a thumbs up. In the see more tab you, you should find a list of the tools that I've used which might help you uh, develop your layout. In the meantime don't forget to subscribe and there should be a video here and here um, for you to watch next. In the meantime take care and I'll see you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks a lot, bye bye.